Cumbria Libraries tonight and I just want to say how pleased we are to be part of Time to Read and we, th and we were thrilled to be offered Alan as part of our the Cumbria hosted event for the New Words, um, New Words events going on. Um, I've just got a couple of housekeeping things to mention to everyone please. We are going to be recording tonight's session but if you don't want to be part of the recording please email me. I have put my email address on the chat box um, that you will see as you Hi everyone. Can you can you see me okay? Yeah, good. Um, yeah, so good evening everyone. Um, I, before we start, I'd just like to say thank you to Kay and um, and to Sue for for all the hard work in setting this up, and also to uh, Alec Newman, uh, the that, um, nice folks in Spoons Press who was responsible for um, putting me on tonight. So uh, it's much appreciated. And thank you everyone for turning up on this chilly March evening. Um, uh, it's a shame we can't all be in the same room together and you know have a glass of wine or a beer at uh, the break. But uh, I guess these virtual events do have um, their advantages. So I know that I'm pretty sure I saw Alistair here uh, from Germany and uh, I think there's a gentleman called John Levy from Tucson, Arizona here. So you get a much more geographically spread audience. So that's nice. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to, um, as Kay said, I'm going to read uh, and talk about my poetry for a, maybe about half an hour and then uh, I'm going to take questions. And then depending on how long the questions take, um, yeah, I don't really know when the event's going to end. So um, think of your questions now, don't make them too hard. And uh, at the end of the event, after the, after the question session, I will um, um, finish, I'll wrap things up by reading a poem just to, to close things down, okay? So uh, the main book that I'm gonna read from tonight is this one. Uh, it's called River Run, and it's published by Now Sports and Spoons Press. It came out in 2019, I think. Um, so, River Run is a collection of poems about the River Trent. Uh, there are 64 poems. They're all sonnets, so they're modernist sonnets. They, they, they don't rhyme or scan. Uh, they're more like the sonnets of Ted Berrigan than Don Patterson. Um, and um, the title of the book, as some of you will know, is taken from, it's the first word of Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. Okay, so it's nothing like Finnegan's Wake, but uh, it isn't. That's a nod to the kind of language for uh, for its own sake, really, that you get in that book. Um, before I start reading, I just want to say something about the, the kind of ideas about poetry that I had when I was putting this collection together. Um, so George Orwell said that good prose is like a window pane. So you don't look at the window pane; you look through it um, to the world. Uh, I would say that good poetry is like a stained glass window. So, okay, I know it's not as good a simile as, as, as Orwell's, but uh, you don't look through a stained glass window, you look at it and it doesn't show you the world. It gives you uh, a kind of, if you like, a copy of the world. And it's just, a, it's just a, a beautiful thing in its own right. So the, the great Scottish poet W.S. Graham said that a poem should be an addition to the world so in other words, it's an object in its own right. It's not there as like an extension to, let's say, a landscape or a human situation. It's something in its own right. So when I put the poems together about the River Trent, I didn't want to write poems which describe the river uh, or which give you information about it. I wanted to somehow embody the river in the poetry. So try and make the poetry have some of the kind of attributes of the river if that makes sense. Um, so the, yeah, that's, that's the kind of, the sort of ideas I had in mind when I was putting the collection together. So I'm gonna read, uh, the first poem I'm gonna read kind of touches on some of those ideas. Um, none of the poems in the book have titles or numbers. And that's partly because, um, although each one is, can be taken as an individual poem, um, the whole thing is like one long poem. So I didn't want to kind of divide them up in that way. Anyway, the first poem uh, is the one I'm gonna read, is the one on page 51. Okay. Rather than looking at the rippled gray expanse 
straining to see its gradations, its levels swollen in March, hidden warblers among the leafless willows, wouldn't it be better to imagine it? Then its depths, peopled and at play, can illuminate the stories you tell of it, how a kingfisher who is the river factors refraction into its gaze, becomes the fish, or how barges with coal, slow-drawn, sepia, silt, and the soils of every country twixt here and there part its surface like the old ferryman, no ghost, alive as you and me. I'll mention the ferryman, the old ferryman again in a moment. Um, so I'm now going to read the first two poems in the collection. The first poem in the collection is a little different to the rest of them uh, and it kind of acts like a bit like a prologue I guess or an introduction to the rest of the collection. Uh, so this is poem number one. The only thing you need to know about this is that um, limnology is the study of water, inland waterways. Okay. I don't know at what point I became a student of limnology, haunter of watercourses, connoisseur of oxbows, lover of the liminal tint of an unsurvivable element we couldn't survive without. But perhaps when I saw the glittering spectacle, escaping words, channeled and chased, bridged, banked, but in the end, unfathomable. And that, although the limnologist may list the geomorphic features or the hydrologic cycle, that doesn't cut it, no. It's the never ceasingness, the invisibility to which we say, dear mystery, are you ever and always only the water or the fish and fowl, marshland, canal, embankment, a virtuality continuum flowing past the man-made caves of Nottingham, breweries, cellars, tanneries, dwellings, mecca bingo, and the two-four twang of strings in the upstairs room of a pub on Mansfield Road. Uh, the second poem is, is more typical of the rest of the poems in the book. Um, this poem uh, has the claim to fame of this poem is it was included as part of the Blackpool Illuminations in 2017. So uh, this is the second poem. How to describe a kingfisher in flight? It was turquoise green with a flash of orange red as it banked to change direction, etc. Knowing it was an idea of a kingfisher that it was part of the brook, the alders, the fish it would catch, the person watching and now describing. It was colour and I walk, headphones off, listening to the leaves speaking in tongues of the river that lives in every cell, laying claim to the world and everything in it. So there are a number of themes that run through the collection and um, when you're talking about a river, a river isn't a place, but it defines places and it passes through places. Uh, so there's place, uh, there's the history associated with the river, and there's the, the language. Okay, so I'm going to uh, read the poem on page um, 50. This is to do with the history. There are a number of references to um, what you might call radical history or alternative history uh, throughout these poems. Uh, and this one, um, mentions someone called George Beck. So in 1831, Nottingham Castle was burned down by rioters and uh, the rioters had a political agenda. So they were protesting against the, the blocking of the Reform Act. Um, and um, they burned down the castle, they sacked a, a country house. And uh, anyway, retribution was, was uh, quite severe. So um, about a, I think about a dozen people were transported for life and six people were hanged uh, in Nottingham, publicly hanged. One of them was George Beck. So I found out that he was actually, uh, had been a boatman on the Trent. So he gets a mention in this poem. Okay. Slung lines taut, blue blush of winter's kiss, blasted, seemingly immortal, pulverized, steamed, driven into drains, culverts, liquidity ratios, plash mode, who wouldn't be angry when misrule and rebelliousness in unequal measure met George Beck, aged 20, boatman, hanged in Nottingham Market Square, Wednesday, 1st of February, 1832, ferried from shore, forever a lost young boatman, sampling the dark depths, 
Let that be a lesson to others. And uh, um, the, this poem uh, mentions two other characters associated with, uh, with Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, and I suppose therefore the Trent. Uh, one is, um, no, that's not quite true. Anyway, Lord Byron is mentioned here. So Lord Byron spent part of his youth in Nottinghamshire. Um, and um, it also mentions Heraclitus, who is the pre-Socratic Greek philosopher. So he, um, he had nothing to do with the Trent, but he did. He, he famously said that you cannot step into the same river twice. Okay, and the opening lines of this poem are just the names of freshwater fish. From bream and barbel, pike and gudgeon, chub, perch, roach and rudd, we glean a fishy taxonomy we can weave into our own words, a classification of ponds and wetlands, drumlins and alluvial clay. The seven Trent catchments serving seven million people, land of Midland suburbia, where Heraclitus and Lord ba Byron argue the toss in the Barton Ferry. Though the waters are always changing, the river stays the same, says H, though the other demurs, saying the river has wrong-footed him and that noon sits under his eyelids, painting an ideal world in coloured ink. Another one of the um, themes of this collection is um, transformation because the river as a, as a physical thing transforms the landscape uh, and it is itself transformed and uh, I live about a mile away from the River Trent and from my house you can see the Radcliffe on Saw power station uh, which uses the water from the river to generate its um, electricity so this poem refers to that sucked into cooling towers, strange dignity, sulphur dioxide turned into TV images, black night river, the blue grey day river, does the river still exist when it's distilled, looking back on itself, boundless above the creeping estates and landfills, refractions singularly distanced from galleries of migrating swallows, we have lingered in the channels of freshwater ecology and seen it contaminated by runoff, the cormorant, enemy to anglers, hanging its wings in mourning. Um, I'm going to talk uh, uh, shortly about um, what kind of technique, writing techniques are used to, to create these, these poems. Um, and, um, but, but I wrote the whole, I put the whole collection together in a, a really short period of time, about four or five weeks. Um, so there's 64 poems in here, so if you do your sums, that's about two poems a day. So it was quite an intense um, experience uh, and um, it was quite an obsessive experience. So obsession is one of the themes that runs through this. Um, so this next poem um, kind of refers to that really. And this is the poem on page 54. Am I repeating myself out of desperate hope? Or is the river habit forming? When did I know it would keep me against my will? I think it was when I no longer needed to look at the river to write about its blues and greys, its surface pattern or the shapes it carves in the alluvial soil. It became my inner landscape. I moved with its moods, dissolved into its surroundings, its waterlogged fields, subsuming myself into its local inflections and the habits of thought molded by the river's turn of phrase. I'll always be an outsider, I know, but the river loves outsiders, even as it keeps them from their home. So I mentioned um, the Barton Ferry. So, uh, as I said, I live I live quite close to the Trent. And when when we first moved here, which was a long time ago, um, there I th I'd heard that there was a ferry which went across the river, and it went at, at Barton, which is a village down not far from here. And um, I used to go and walk down the footpath by the Trent to try and find this ferry. Anyway, it turns out it, it ceased operation long before we got here. Uh, but it became a bit of a legendary thing for me. And um, so the Barton Ferry and the Ferryman 
works its way into these poems. And there's various references to it. Um, and um, it kind of, you can't help but, there's, there's kind of an allusion there to, you know, the ferryman over the river, Styx, which take, takes people to the land of the dead. You know, so it's kind of in there as well. Um, so I'm going to read this poem, which refers to the Barton ferryman. And uh, the first few lines of this poem are talking about the, there's a water sports centre at home, Pierpoint on the Trent, not far from here. Yeah. Pontoon jetties, white water for kayaks and canoes, nine sprint lanes, Words can't come fast enough for this triathlon-friendly world of water, though what would the Barton ferryman think? Shady, disreputable, working after dark, when the weary traveller has no choice, when she blends with the browns and greys, feels the currents drag, the tug of weed, submerged bike chains and shopping carts, hallucinates underwater worlds, and wishes the Trent would run in a new course, evenly, and fair. Uh, those last two lines um, refer to um, the, the there's like a what do you call these things epigraph the epigraph is that the word uh, at the start of the collection um, which is the smug and silver trent so uh, that um, is the only time that the trent is mentioned in Shakespeare so he mentioned it in, in Henry the Fourth Part One where the rebels are looking at a map of England and they're dividing up the country uh, or saying how they will divide up the country when they've got rid of the king and the Trent is the the dividing line between north and south and so um, anything north of the Trent it would be given to the Northumbrian leader Hotspur and uh, he looks at the map and he's not very happy because there's a big bend in the river which cuts out a piece of land that he wants so he threatens to divert the course of the river and uh, he says that if he does that, then the smug and silver Trent will run in a new channel evenly and fair. So it's used there, the Trent as a frontier. And that's another one of the themes that runs through the collection of the river as a, as a border or a frontier. So, all right, I'm going to uh, read one more poem and then I'll just talk a little bit about how I put this collection together. Um, this poem is um, there's various kind of, as I've said, political references in the, the poems. Um, so this one, I suppose, contains one of those. Something is changing, something may be unstoppable, and it is involved in larger forces, levels of ice and sea, complexity of speech and act, in a garden or kitchen, or the unreeling of sleep, the moth at evening, the fly by day, the witless universe on roller skates, on a moped through Sniper's Alley, postal code gangland tracks, food banks, something is changing and all the king's horses and all the king's men are being deployed in case of insurrection. So yeah, I, I, I thought, as I, I, I kind of thought with this festival um, or this, this event, uh, had a creative writing element. So I just thought I'd say something that might be of interest uh, about how I put the collection together. Um, so uh, I keep, like I expect a lot of you on this, uh, in, the, in the audience, uh, I keep notebooks. So there they are. In case you didn't know what a notebook looked like. Um, the notebooks are all handwritten, as you would expect. And when I was writing, these are probably about two years worth, and uh, when I was writing, at the time I was writing River Run, I had the practice of writing in a notebook uh, most days. Uh, so I'd write in the notebook, I'd fill at least one page, and then I'd turn the page and not reread it. Okay, so I don't think that's quite important. So I put it aside, didn't reread it. And when you do that, over time, you build up quite a stock of, of text, which you can then draw on. And um, people, somebody asked me, possibly someone on this, on this uh, in the audience asked me, um, why did you write 64 poems about the Trent? And I don't really know why. <laughs> why do you write poems about anything, I suppose? But it all started with a single phrase that I found in a, a notebook. And uh, the phrase is uh, this one, I'm using basic technology here. It's given a river silver sleeve and living vein. And I found that phrase in a notebook, in one of my notebooks. 
So I suppose I must have written it. Uh, and uh, it all started from that. And the, that, that phrase contains some of the elements of the sequence. So um, it represents the, well, first of all, the sound of words is, is obviously important in a, in a poems like the ones in that, this book. So in that phrase, you have the, the um, alliteration of the V sounds, the repeated V sounds. You have the assonance of the, the, I, the I sounds. Uh, so, and you have the river represented as a living thing, uh, personified, in fact. It also says, given a river. So given a river, then what follows on from that? And what follows on from that is all the things I've mentioned, you know, language, history, um, and, and um, natural history, etc. So it started from there and I just started writing the poems. I wrote them on a laptop uh, at the keyboard. Uh, I wrote them almost, not quite, but almost in the order which they appear in the book. So I write a poem and then put it one side and move on to the next one. Uh, I didn't re revise really very much. But what I did do during the whole process is, was I drew on the, the notebooks. So I, um, I was able to mine the notebooks and I was halfway through writing a piece then I would need another line or a phrase. I'd go to the notebook and extract something from it. Um, for me, um, poetry is, the art of poetry, the art of writing a poem is quite a mysterious, it's a mysterious process and it involves the unconscious. And um, I think there are various ways of tapping into that. One of them I think is just to use notebooks like I did, where you, you write in them quite quickly, you put it to one side and you don't reread it. Um, and when you're putting together a collection or a sequence of poems, that, that's consciously constructed. So you've got the two sides of the, the brain, I suppose. Uh, you have the, the conscious mind, which is putting together a sequence of poems in a particular order. And then the unconscious work, which I felt came from the notebooks and was, you know, put into the poems from there. So I just thought that might be of interest, really. That's what I was doing when I put the whole thing together. Um, anyway, you can ask questions on that when you get, uh, shortly. I'm going to move on now and read from, um, let me see, just check the time. Okay. I'm going to read from this collection. A Journal of Enlightened Panic. So this came out only last year, so it's quite new. And um, let me just find the poem. So in terms of writing techniques, one of the things I did in this collection was I collaborated with another poet, uh, with a poet called Robert Shepherd. Um, Robert put together an anthology called The European Union of Imaginary Authors. And um, he had one imaginary author for every country in the EU. Um, and he represented um, the UK. So he's, he's now being ejected from, uh, <laughs> from the union. Uh, but um, I, I was, and he collaborated, Robert collaborated with a different poet for each, um, for each imaginary poet. So I, I got the Slovenian poet, ABC Remic. Um, so um, the way we worked was uh, this, this poem has stanzas. So I wrote one stanza, then Robert wrote one, then I wrote one. And there's a second poem, which um, is a block of text. And he wrote two lines, I wrote two lines, etc. And what was interesting for me, there's that the end result doesn't sound like me and it doesn't sound like Robert. So it sounds like a third poet. Um, so, which I guess was the idea. So I'm just gonna read the first poem that we put together. Um, and this is called, If I Were. If I were a blade of grass, I'd be bending in the wind like all the others, in the wind of the past that smells of the sea. If I were rowing in ripples, I'd be unrolling in crinkles of light against the hills, distance unthreading perception gently. If I were empty of perception, I could abandon history and encounter the world, my enemy, my friend, my teacher, in all its variousness. If then, beyond time, flung across space, a jay caught in a gust, I'd know identity as a silhouette bird acting as a scarecrow choking up a paroxysm of irony. If the scarecrow smiles, if sirens call lonely men on container ships and ghosts walk the leagues of grass, then storm clouds, tribal wanderings, ritual. If overhead wires trapped onto a page of dashes tell us of nothing or next to nothing, then the solid black I feel is not ghostly solid. My ears are up to my eyes in 
reality. Um, right, check my notes, see what's coming next. Right, I'm going to jump back now to a much earlier book. So this book, you can see that, uh, it's called Variations on Painting a Room and it came out exactly uh, 10 years ago. Uh, almost, yeah, it was, I think it was April 2011 it came out. And it was collected poems at the time. And um, yeah, so some of these poems were written quite a long time ago. And I'm going to read this poem, which is a short piece. Uh, it's kind of unusual um, among my poetry because, um, because it's uh, a love poem. And also because it's in rhyme, it's in rhymed couplets, but they're, they're half rhymes, but still. And it's called Like Lapwings. Um, so Lapwings, um, Lapwings um, do a, a kind of, a pair of Lapwings in the springtime will do a kind of courtship dance in midair. And so, Like Lapwings. The pair of Lapwings you point out, dance over fells in cloudy light, clasp contour, angle wings, as over all misgivings, the winds of chance will turn me. The paradigm of our breathless journey over lake and ridge, praxis and sudden knowledge mend us as the day mends. Sunshine and the breeze sends wavelets over the dark lake, reflecting when the clouds break, the clear fells where lapwings fly, between them, it seems, telepathy. Um, so I'm not going to read, we're almost done now, uh, but I just want to read another poem from River and I'll, I'll read this separately to the others because um, the poems in River Run are not personal poems, so they don't tell you anything about my life or what I feel about things. Um, and uh, there is a, a speaker in the poems, but it's not very well defined, so it's, um, uh, it's really often just a device. So to be able to make statements. Um, but there is one exception, and I'm going to read that one now. So I'll read the poem, and then I'll tell you how it came about. Okay. This is the poem on page 11. I watch a young woman walk over the bridge in the nightlit city, a slender person walking purposefully, head bowed. And I wonder what chance has in store, and wish her well. So well, in fact, that my wish brings me nearer to prayer than I've ever been. A prayer to chance, or to the gold-green wavelets of the street-lit river, to hope, or to whatever goddess watches over slender, bowed, purposeful young persons. So, the um, young woman in the poem is actually my youngest daughter, uh, Eloise, who is here tonight, but she was warned in advance. Uh, and, um, the way the poem came about was that uh, Eloise, she, she was studying in Prague and we went over to, to visit her and we rented an apartment and she was at our apartment and at the end of the evening she said, right, I'm, I'm going now, back to my apartment. So she went off and I uh, kind of watched her uh, walk off into this foreign city in, in the night and uh, it was a kind of strange feeling, you know. So um, I was on the balcony of the apartment and um, I just opened a notebook and just wrote that pretty much as I've read it there. I had to kind of massage it a bit to get it in 14 lines, but that's how the, that came about. And then I, I, I shut the notebook and forgot about it. And then sometime afterwards, I kind of re rediscovered it. And I thought, well, actually that would fit quite well, well into, uh, into this collection. No one will know that it's not about the trend. Um, no one will ever know. So anyway, that, I just thought that that was a little bit different to the rest of the poems in the book, so I thought I'd uh, highlight that one. Okay. And I think it's almost time for me to wrap up, so I'm going to read um, an extract from a longer poem just to finish. Um, so in this collection, there's a long poem at the end called Voyager, um, and um, it's dedicated to the memory of my mother, who died in 2015. And um, it, it uses some borrowed text. So it uses text from the website of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory run by NASA. And it also borrows from a, a blog kept by a sailor on a, on a container ship 
and he was working around the world on container ships and kept a blog. So I wrote to him and asked his, his permission to use that. And it, it refers to four, uh, four journeys. So there's a, a nighttime journey, a nighttime walk by a character called Alan. There's a nighttime drive also by a character called Alan. There is the sea journey. And then there's the journey of the Voyager spacecraft, which was launched in um, 1977, I think. Um, and um, there were two spacecraft in fact. Um, so I'm just going to read the last part, okay? And the, incidentally, on the cover of this book, there is the gold disc, which uh, was put into the Voyager spacecraft to tell whoever might be out there about something about humanity. So this is the last part of that poem. It's just three stanzas. Uh, two stanzas. Okay. Alan looks back and sees that it's autumn across the valley. The gravel pits, business park, hotel on the A605, the yellow and red clumps of trees between the houses all speak of something lost. Alan wants to know whether quantum theory indicates the universe had no beginning or whether each black hole is a gateway to another universe and wishes to be confirmed in his belief that he'll never see them again, the dead, and also whether the theory that all of time is continually present could ever mean anything to a life in a small Midlands valley with a business park, gravel pits, new housing estates built by Barrett and a crematorium. In the autumn fog, coordinates are difficult to gauge, sounds are unclear, and the paths can be followed, but only with a sense that we have no choice until the mist clears and we can talk to each other, to everyone, not just the quick, but those who are so slow we may never get a reply from them. And why should we? No one has been to interstellar space before. It's like traveling with guidebooks that are incomplete, said Stone. Still, uncertainty is part of the exploration. We wouldn't go exploring if we knew exactly what we'd find. But for sure, in about 40,000 years, Voyager will be closer to the star AC7938 than our own sun. In autumn dusk, lying in bed, listening to the foghorns on the River Tyne, wanting to not grow up, but here he is. Not having expected to lose the path or care too much about the old guard when they'd gone, but he does, surprisingly much. Okay. That's it from me for, for the moment. Um, so I'm going to take questions now. And then, as I said, after the questions, I'll just read a short poem to, uh, to wrap things up. So um, anyway. Thanks, Alan. Um, I've just got a couple of observations, first of all, from Paul Sutton, who said, Hi, Alan. Nice Elliot hint. Use of the We Have Lingered in the Radcliffe Power Station poem, CF Proofrock. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea. Um, yeah. Great stuff, Paul. <laughs> Thank you for well spotted. Um, Sandra Mangan is saying, I love the changes of tempo, like the river itself. Uh, and our first question is from Simon Collins, who said, Hi Alan, at what point did you decide to make each poem 14 lines? Presumably establishing this constraint, this was an important part of the process of generating the sequence. Yes, uh, thank you, Simon. That's a, a really good question. I, I made that decision right at the start, like right from the outset. So um, I, I kind of had, I, as I said, I had that kind of phrase which kicked things off. And I guess I'd been preoccupied, I live very close to the Trent, and I guess I'd been preoccupied with certain aspects of it. So they were in the notebooks. But when, when I decided to put together a book of poems about the trend, I immediately thought, yeah, I'm going to make it into a, a sonnet sequence. And um, I'd been reading lots of sonnet sequences, including um, the, 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 some of you will know, the sonnets of Ted Berrigan, who was an American poet who kind of reinvented the sonnet in the 1960s. And um, I kind of modelled these ones on, on his really. So if that answers your question, Simon, it was right from the outset and that, that kind of governed the way I thought about the whole thing really was that it was a sonnet sequence. That's great, thank you. Um, and Sandra Mangan is asking, what was working with another poet liberating or did it perhaps feel constricting? Well, it was both actually. Um, it was quite an interesting experience because I'd never done it before. And um, I did 
even though they're short poems, I did actually use some of my previous notebook entries to, to put them together. But you can't do that completely when, when you're working with another poet because um, you have to respond to what they've written. And so you're really out on your own, you know, and it forces you to uh, just be a bit more creative. Um, so it was quite liberating because it, it takes you away from your own voice and you have to inhabit another voice and, or be in tune with another voice. Um, and at the same time, it was, it is, yeah, I would say it was more of a liberation than a restriction, really. It was, it was a very interesting thing to do. Great. Um, Alistair is asking, now, what role do the specials play in your poetic life? <laughs> <laughs> Someone else has spotted your t-shirt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, a very big role, as you can see. I wear it for my big reading. Um, yeah. Well, well, you, you, yeah, you might think it's probably actually what one of my. Okay, we're talking about the specials, but um, song lyrics have been a huge influence on me, as I'm sure they are on many of the other poets here tonight, and uh, poets like Linton Quasi Johnson and and uh, Benjamin Zephaniah, for example. So, anyway, yeah, thanks, Alison. <laughs> Um, Andrew Taylor would like to know, ask you, how much editing went into River Run after your initial writing phase? Okay, that's, a, that's also a good question. Um, actually, very little. That, that's not necessarily typical because other books like this one, for example, th there's been a lo lot of editing went on there, you know, a lot of fine tuning. But River Run was different somehow. Um, I wrote it very quickly, as I said, in about four or five weeks. And um, what I would do was I would write a poem and then put it aside and move on to the next one without looking back on it. And then I put them, put them away um, for a few weeks and went back to them. And I, yeah, I mean, I'm rambling now, but basically I, I didn't revise them very much at all, is the question. Then pretty much as they came out. Thank you. Um, Paul Sutton has asked a question. What other river poems and poets were you conscious of? Um, Hart Crane, Alice Oswald. Also, have you read Orwell's Coming Up for Air? I reread recently and he makes an excellent point about the gorgeous poetry of English coarse fishnet.